Hi, this is Gabe from FluentForever.com. In this third video, we're going to talk about Japanese vowels. My primary goal here is to get you familiar with the IPA symbols for these vowels and to give you a rough sense of how they fit in your mouth. Now keep in mind throughout this process, the better you learn to hear these sounds, the better you'll be able to keep track of which one is which, and the better you'll produce them. We're going to be talking a bit about tongue placement, so to give you a rough sense of that, try this. Compare e, e, and a in English, as in seat, set, and sat. Uh, you'll notice your tongue starts up high, e, then goes to the middle of your mouth, e, and then goes down to a. So your tongue can go up and down. It can also go forward and back. Compare e as in bet and a uh as in but. Your tongue goes forward for e, and then pulls back for a. Uh, bet, but. If you'd like a much more in-depth discussion about vowel formation, check out some of the videos linked below, but for the beginning, it's about all we're going to need. So let's get to some Japanese. As before, I have Saki here to help me with this. Hi. On some levels, Japanese is extremely simple when it comes to vowels. Depending upon how you count, English has 11 or 12 vowels. And Japanese has just five. A, I, U, E, O. Not only that, but you already know most of their IPA symbols. They're just lowercase a, i, u, e, and o, although that u has a pair of arrows underneath that we'll talk about later on. So our challenge here isn't memorization, at least when it comes to the IPA symbols. It's figuring out how to pronounce each of these vowels accurately. So we'll start with the easiest one, e. E shows up in Japanese in iruka, and English is si. It's basically the same in both languages, unless your dialect of English actually uses two vowels when you say e. If you say C si or say, uh, you'll need to get rid of that first vowel and stick to the second. E, si. The next vowel we'll cover is E, as in elevator or eacon. Here's where we'll take advantage of our earlier discussion about vowel height. Now, you remember how E was high up in your mouth and E was in the middle of your mouth? Well, Japanese's E tends to be between those two. So if you want to compare the Japanese E to the English one, we can compare Japanese's any to English's any. Any, any, E, E. Our next vowel is O, as in organ or go. This vowel is very similar to American English's O, as in go. The issue with the vowel in go is that it's actually two vowels. You start at O, which is the vowel you want, but then go to U. Japanese stays put. We say go. And now we come to the second to last of Japanese's vowels. A, as in aidon or amondo. This vowel is similar to the English A, as in father, but it's a bit more forward in your mouth. You can get a feel for that by comparing the English words fawn and fan. When you say fawn, your tongue is low and far back in your mouth, and when you say fan, your tongue moves forward. The Japanese vowel a ah, is around halfway between those two. So there's fawn, fan, and in Japanese, fan. Our last vowel in Japanese is u, as in ukurere. Uh, the tongue position here is basically the same as English's u vowel. Your tongue is high up and back in your mouth, which is why we're using a lowercase u here in the IPA. Uh, the main difference between u and u has to do with what's going on with your lips. In English, to make an u sound, you do two things. You tense up your lips so they form into a small circle, and you stick them out away from your teeth. U. Japanese does something fairly different here. Remember our discussion about the Japanese f as in fudo or furamingo to make that f sound. You need to bring your upper and lower lips close together. You need to sort of compress them together. The corners of your mouth come in just a little bit, but your lips don't stick out at all. That turns out to be the exact mouth position you need to use for this vowel. So if you can say f with just your lips and not your teeth, f, then you can say u, f, f. To compare that vowel to English's u, try English's su and Japanese su. Su, su, u, u. And with that, we've covered all five vowels of Japanese. There are two more topics to discuss before we finish up on vowels completely. Long vowels and devoiced vowels. We'll start with the long vowels. As we mentioned back in video one, Japanese is a very even language when it comes to timing. Each character is spoken for a fixed, equal length of time. So what happens when you have a syllable like to, followed by that same vowel, o? Whenever this happens, you're going to double the length of the vowel, and this occurs all the time in Japanese. For instance, there's tori, bird, and tori, street, and obasan, aunt, and obasan, grandmother. In IPA, you'll generally see this mark using a colon-looking symbol, which just tells you to lengthen the preceding letter. Every once in a while, though, you may also see this marked with two vowels in a row, like this. Consonants actually do this, too. 
There's a character in both of the kana syllabaries that will double the length of the next consonant. Turning a word like saka, slope, into saka, author. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to keep Japanese syllables even in length. It's the only way you can use double consonants and double vowels. So that out of the way, we'll move on to our final topic, devoiced vowels. Basically, in normal spoken Japanese, there are a few situations where an E vowel or an U vowel is basically just whispered. You put your tongue and lips in the position of the vowel that's written, but when that vowel actually happens, you don't let your vocal cords vibrate. It sounds like this, Christmas Eve. You're not saying Christmas Eve, and you're also not skipping those vowels completely. It's not Christmas Eve. It's Christmas Eve. This shows up more with U than E, but it does happen with E, and it even sounds slightly different. That gives you words like Kishi and Kushi, where the only difference is an unvoiced vowel. And a lot of that difference in sound has to do with what happens to the consonant. Even if you're just whispering that E vowel, it's going to influence how you pronounce the K. Basically, you're palatalizing it. I'll give you some guidelines about how to predict whether a vowel can be devoiced or not in the next video. But for now, I just want you to know about those sounds, since that means we've now covered all of the sounds of Japanese. So, to quickly review, uh, we have five basic vowels. There was E as in Iruka, which is basically the same as English as E as in C. E as in Erebeta, which is somewhere between English as E and E. O as in Orugan, which is similar to the first vowel in O as in Go. You just stay on that beginning O part. Go, O, 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 Go, O. A as in Amundo. Which is basically halfway between Oz and Father and As and Fan. And then we covered U as in Ukurede. Which has the tongue position of English's U vowel, but the lip position of the Japanese F. <sighs> your lips compress towards each other, the corners of your mouth pull in just a little bit, and you don't let your lips stick out. <laughs> Fu, Flamingo, Ukurede. After we covered those five vowels, we went on to talk about double vowels and double consonants. Basically, the difference between Tori and Tori for double vowels, and saka and saka for double consonants. Last, we talked about devoiced e and u, as in Christmas Eve, kishi and kushi. These are basically whispered vowels, which most audibly affect the consonants that come before them. You'll tend to palatalize the consonants that come before voiceless e, k, 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 and you'll tend to have normal consonants before voiceless u, k, k, k. And with that, we're done with all of the sounds of Japanese. Next stop, a few Japanese spelling rules.